What is the vibe today? Ray, what is the vibe today? What is like well, what's the overarching message you say? I, I'm not sure exactly. Like we're doing an episode about a a very weird character called Francis Parker Yoki and um we'll probably do more episodes on him now than we initially planned. And he cool. he's like a specific and different guy from the ones that we talked about so far. They're all different. Yeah. I yes. mean different. <laughs> It's, um, he's different in a few ways. Should I just go into it? No, let's, uh, <laughs> let's, let's do a know, proper intro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're going for different. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely different. And, uh, also the source that I'm using is different and he's different. Okay. It's a very spe- a specific, let's say. All right. Okay. So we got a, a very different episode today. I mean, he... <laughs> He's different in the sense that, like, we have this whole Gladio thing, and this uh-huh. is like something that's more connected to the other side, like fascist being connected to the Eastern Bloc. Is he a pedophile? No, uh, he's also then different it is in different. that. It is different, uh, he's yeah. he he had like many relationships with grown like adult women. Wow. Yes. Wow. So, All right. Well, now I'm excited about it. And he's also anti-American, Dang. but American. Welcome to The Empire Never Ended. Uh, we're here with Fritz, Ray, Boris, the whole crew, and yeah. um, we're introducing a new freak to our, oh, our uh, card deck. <laughs> <laughs> Little uh, Soon to be there. quite literally, yeah. huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we got Francis Parker, Yaki today. Yoki? Yaki? Yucky? What do we say? I guess Yaki, you might can say, I don't know. All right. We got, uh, yeah, Frank Yucky. Mr. Yuck. All right, uh-huh. well... Uh, Ray, um, good for you taking on this one. This is uh, yeah. an important man for these freaks. He He's a, definitely a specific guy, like different from the ones that we talked about until now. And the story is a, a bit different. Like we have this whole thing that we're kind of more teasing than actually talking about the, the Gladio connection, the connection right, between yeah. fascist and, you know, Western intelligence, specifically CIA which is something that we'll talk about more in depth, probably in one of the arcs in the future. But this story is kind of, has something to do with that, but it's also the opposite of that because it's a story about American and Western Nazis who are like pro-Soviet and Ah, possibly even have some connections with uh, like Eastern Bloc intelligence. Um, So yeah, in a few ways, it's a a weird story. And um, is it? The origin of the third position or something? Well, I mean, you could say that, but also, I mean, fascism itself is the yeah, origin sure. of the third position. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. As we talked about a lot in Arc 2. Yeah. So I'm using a book uh, by Kevin Coogan. Uh, Coogan, unfortunately, died, I think, in 2020. And the book is a, it's a huge book, I think almost 700 pages. It's called Dreamer of the Day. A subtitle Francis Parker Yoki and the Post War Fascist International. It was published more than 20 years ago by Autonomy Media, and it's very difficult to find. I wish someone would republish it. it definitely. Yeah, uh, big yeah. shout outs to the people that helped us get it because it was not easy. Uh, no. <laughs> not easy to acquire. No. Um, Caused Ray much stress. Yeah. But yeah, it's a, it's a valuable book to have. Yeah. I know about uh, this book for like many, many years. But uh, finally got it uh, some time ago, and it's, yeah, it's very interesting. I think we'll come back to it a lot during this podcast. So, uh, yeah, we'll do more episodes on on Yonki than we planned. So, uh, I'm not in a, like, a big hurry. We'll take it a bit slow. So, this first episode will cover his, like, early period, and we'll practically end the episode in 1945. So, we're going really to his, like, early days. Cool. Oh, this is nice. We're going way back to the to the thirties to our bread and butter back there at the beginning. Yeah, of the yes. Arc. You will okay. mention a lot of people that we already talked about. Some familiar faces. Yeah. Very nice. Good for the holidays. See old yes. friends and family like this. Yeah. <laughs> Francis Parker Yoki was born in Chicago 
1917. Uh, his parents were Louis Francis and Rose Ellen uh, Yockey. Um, Yockey was the youngest of four children. He has a brother, J James, who is not important to the story. Apparently, they, they didn't have any almost any contact with him. Lucky but James. But his two sisters, Winette and uh, Alice, are important to the story. And it seems they were close with uh, Francis and also probably his collaborators as well, as we will see. Interesting. Um uh, a family was uh, like a, a Catholic family, probably of Swiss or maybe Southern German origin. Um, they were an upper middle class family. Uh, so his father, Louis, uh, was trained as a lawyer, but he worked as a stock stockbroker. And they kept like a um, strong cultural ties to Europe. So, for example, after they got married, his parents, they lived in Paris for a few years and his two sisters were born there. Fancy. And then they... They returned to Chicago. They were very much into like classical music. Uh, his uh, mother Rose uh, went to Chicago Music College, and Francis Parker himself was a, a musical prodigy. And people say that he was like an excellent pianist. Mm. Uh, there were also some rumors among fascists that Yoki is of partial Jewish origin. Uh, like for example, James Madol, the leader of the National Renaissance Party, who was like a friendly with Yoki, knew him. Yeah, the guy whose like close friend was uh, Dan Burroughs, an actual Jewish Nazi. Yeah, yeah. yeah he right. he Madol wrote that in some text that how Yoki was like one quarter of Jewish origin. He didn't wrote that to dismiss him. Right. Uh, he just like wrote it as a kind of matter of fact thing. I don't know if this is true. There's no definite confirmation of that. Well, um, I mean, it's interesting uh, to mention uh, because Yoki was very much influenced. Like he's. Uh, really a follower of Oswald Spangler, who yes. we mentioned before. That's his main guy. And he uh, he follows him in uh, this idea uh, of rejecting biological racism while still being a horrible racist. Um, right. We we talked about this a lot with the O9A because they also are yeah. big aficionados of Spangler's work. Yeah. So, like, for example, Spengler, like, he rejected uh, the idea of uh, racial purity as some kind of ridiculous idea, like, people were always kind of, uh, you know, uh, mixing it up uh, with each other through history, so some, like, there is no constant biological race and so on, which is, you know, all true. So, Yoki, for example, following Spengler, uh, agrees, and he says something, um, a race is not um, a group anatomy, it's not independent of soil, uh, race is not independent of spirit and history, um, they're not classifiable um, except in, in an arbitrary uh, way. So uh, it's, uh, race is not a rigid, permanent, collective uh, characteristic of human beings, which remains always the same throughout history. So he says all of that, but he's still like uh, 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 just like a, Person He's still racist. That, he he <laughs> yeah. basically thinks that white people are superior, uh, but not only like uh, or through biology, but because of historical and cultural reasons. So, so race isn't real, but I'm going to base an entire account of human history on it. Yeah, although they, they say they don't, uh, but they do. It's a cultural thing, right? That's how they pass it off. It's like yes. the spirit of a civilization and all that. Yeah. We should mention, because uh, we haven't yet, that um, his major work is Imperium, which we're going to be talking about. That is written a bit later, but yeah. um, just to say. We'll have a, probably a few episodes on just Imperium. So I won't talk a, a, a lot about it. It's definitely Yoki's like ma, uh, like magnum opus, but yeah. it's. Uh, I will just mention a few things that we need to know to understand who he was. But we'll do separate episodes just on the book. Um, so, as I said, he was close to his sisters. Uh, some family friend even says that his sister, uh, uh, Winette, actually brought him up and was his real mother and took okay. care of him since he was, like, very young. Um, the Great Depression had, like, a big impact, a negative impact on the Yoki family. So, uh, they went through a financial crisis and they basically had to leave Chicago. They, in 1932, they went to the hometown of his parents, where Louis, his father, worked as a clerk, and he died in 1936, aged 51. Um, there were some stories that he died in some horrible 
uh, car accident, uh, that Yoki was the driver, that he was hurt himself, that this was very traumatic for Yoki. Others say that his father just drank himself to death. Uh Um, So we don't know. Yeah, Could be the same story, really. There's probably a reason Yoki was driving (laughs) and not his dad, if that story (laughs) happened. Yeah. Here, son, get behind the wheel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So some claimed, you know, because Yoki... Uh, is uh, different from the American fascists we discussed so far, that he's very much anti-American. He's very European in his fascism, like uh, we'll talk about uh, more about that. But some believe that his hatred for America was really emotionally linked to the, you know, the downfall of his family uh, during the Depression, and especially to the downfall of his father. And that they, For this reason, he hated America, because uh, America killed his father. It's interesting that this is true because uh, many people in the future that we've already talked about who you would say are Americanist will cling to Yoki. Uh, for instance, the, the guys who founded the National Youth Alliance, like the, the Yoki movement was part of this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we also, we'll talk more about them, I, uh, I think, in a few episodes, one maybe. Um, so in 1934, Yoki became a student at the uh, University of Michigan uh, at Ann Arbor. Um Apparently, while there, there he, for a time at the beginning, he was known as a, a pro-communist. Uh, and he actually got into some trouble for uh, playing the international on the piano at some school party. Uh, huh. But this communist phase didn't last long, as while there in Ann Arbor, he also became a fascist. Um, and he became a believer in the supremacy of the German race and their political future. Uh, this is where Yoki encountered his most important intellectual influence, which is uh, Oswald Spengler that we already uh, mentioned in his uh, book, The Decline of Western Civilization or, or West. Yeah, uh, Decline of uh, the West, yeah. yeah. Um, following Spengler, Yoki believed that uh, all great cultures go through different uh, historical phases that succeed each other, um, and there's like a, a rise and fall of every culture, and that a culture uh, is superseded by a state of decay, which Spangler calls civilization. So civilization is mm-hmm. a culture in decay, um, and civilization as a phase of historical development is determined by... Uh, by dominated by money, greed, and materialism, and uh, widespread sense of spiritual exhaustion. So the European culture, um, the Faustian, like Faustian culture, entered this uh, decadent civilizational phase in 1789, according to Spengler, so after the French Revolution. Uh, so Yoki had an almost like a religious experience while reading Spengler, uh, in college, and um, he he called Spangler the philosopher of the 20th century. This was his kind of name for him. This is how he referred to him in his writings. Um, and according to Spangler, the last stage of civilization is um, Caesarism. Uh, how do you call it? Caesarism? Caesarism? Yeah, yeah. I guess That's Caesarism. Huh? Caesarism. So this is index. a... index. Yeah, this is a time when <laughs> uh, society becomes increasingly... Um, dominated by totalitarian uh, strongmen who aim to overcome um, uh, uh, like outworn forms of liberal parliamentary democracy. So Caesarism is very unstable. It leads to a series of horrific wars which held uh, the end of the c- uh, culture's life uh, cycle. So basically Caesarism is kind of an attempt to overcome the shortcomings of this decadent phase, but also it really leads to an end of, of a culture. It probably helped that, you know, y- Yoki saw a guy named Caesar, Caesar Billy in Germany, <laughs> take take a bunch of people to war, you know. I think he's, it's not like a, it's well, not a super imaginative stretch here. No, he, yeah. but this is like the 30s, so he, what he has in mind is Hitler. Uh, mm-hmm. This is his uh, guy. He, he, in his books, he calls, uh, you know, Spengler is the philosopher, but Hitler is the hero. He refers yes. to him, mm-hmm. and he dedicates his book, Imperium, to the hero of the Second World War, which is Hitler. Right. And he, but he approaches Hitler and Nazism through this, this uh, kind of Spenglerian reading of it. Uh, although he changes a little bit, because, you know, according to Spengler, Really, Caesarism and then 
something like Nazism would be, you know, a herald of the end of the culture. But Yoki sees there a possibility of a renewal. Um, so, uh, according to Spengler, the only challenge in such a phase is how to live a heroic and meaningful life in the violent winter time of the West. You know, so basically, it's a very kind of um, pessimistic outlook. But uh, and we Yoki... can see how it shaped the future of fascism too. Really, yeah, I yeah. mean, uh, the the, yeah. the end of the world theme yes. picked up from here. Really, yes, a lot of them think that the world. The, the war ended, basically, uh, yeah. when the Nazis lost the war, and now it's And just... that's a good thing, in a way. <laughs> yeah. Now is the time to strike. Uh, so, but Yoki, at, at this time, at least, he's, uh, he uh, still... Um, he sees that the, the coming of the Caesars is maybe... There's some potential for the rebirth of the West there. Um, yeah, so, not, not at all, what Spengler said. Yeah. So, in Hitler, yeah. he saw, like, a, an attempt to realize the European Empire... But unfortunately for Yoki, uh, he says that, uh, you know, Hitler, like Napoleon, who Yoki also admired, fell victim to whom? To the barbarian Slavs. Hey. Hey. So that's what you get when you fuck with us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Spengler was really... So Spengler kind of, um, he belonged to this uh, German, it was later called Conservative Revolution. Mm kind of milieu, I guess you can call it that, which is a very heterogeneous milieu of different types of people, all fascist, um, and all kind of not Hit exactly Hitlerian Nazis. Like, mm -hmm. many of them saw some potential in Hitler, um, but they had their own fascist ideas, which were different from his. They were Hitler curious. Yeah, yes, uh, definitely you could say that. <laughs> Uh, Spengler was one of them, but you, a lot of these people will will talk about them uh, a lot during this podcast, I think. But uh, with you know, with this kind of d fascist dissidents that are especially important for you know people like later the European New Right or even later the so-called alt right, all of these people who try to make fascism kind of more intellectually interesting. They like these people because they are like, um, you know, intellectuals and so on. But uh, they are heterogeneous in a way that you can clearly see that some of them are people who kind of were quasi-socialist. They, they took the socialist part of national socialism more seriously in, in, in some very fa fascistic way. So they, they tried, or they, they at least claimed that they are serious about overcoming some shortcomings of capitalism through some fascistic uh, solutions. Uh, so that is, the, for example, the so-called uh, you know, uh, left wing of the Nazi party, like uh, the Strasser brothers, or uh, like uh, the circles which were called you know, national revolutionary or national Bolshevik, close to Ernst Junger and other people. But on the other hand, you have people who are more right-wing than Nazis, like who criticize right. it from the right. So, uh, and Spengler is one of them, and he's, you can see also his influence on uh, Julius Evola in that, because, uh, for example, Spengler thought that the uh, real government must always be aristocratic, and that mm -hmm. every nation in history was always led by an, an aristocratic minority. So, uh, he saw Nazism as maybe having some potential like a wall saw, like, for example, fascism, but that uh, what he didn't like about it, it was too proletarian, it was too plebeian, uh, in, right. that say, in that sense, uh, decadent. Um, Spengler, I think as Fritz mentioned in one of our previous episodes, advocated his own version of national socialism, with, which he called Prussian socialism, which was this kind of nationalistic socialism, but what was important for him, was we, it went you know, top down, you not know, the other way. So it yeah. was installed by the monarch in the state basically. It's amazing that he wrote this whole book that said that uh, civilization, which is, he defines as like the existence of elites, like culture bearing elites, that it doesn't work. It devolves into a dictatorship and falls apart. So his, of course, of course, what he does is advocate more of it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Great. Spengler is also the guy who used, the, as we mentioned before, the, the term Magian. Um, yeah, oh yeah, you know, Faustian, Magian, that's all. That's yeah, so all. Magian, basically, code word for Jewish and the kind of antithesis to Faustian culture. Um, I think Spengler was also, though, a little more, um, uh, he was a little subtler about it, too, because he included essentially any Middle Eastern culture into that. I guess, right. yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so Yoki, 
definitely like into Hitler, but has a specific way of entering it, which is not very, you know, Hitlerian per se. So he's uh, later seen by some like Orthodox Nazis and is not a real Nazi for it. Although he dedicates his book to Hitler, but he he's kind of uh, w- the way that he enters it is, you know, through Spengler and people who are not very Orthodox Nazis in that sense. Picky, picky. Yeah, and in that in that sense, he's very specific for America because he's basically a representative of this what was later called conservative revolution, but an American guy and who's mm, yeah. already into it in the 30s. Mm-hmm, so that's what really kind of differentiates him from a lot of other American Nazis, you know. Um, um, in 1936, Yoki is 19 years old. He transfers to another university. This this, this time, to another school. He goes to the Georgetown University's prestigious school uh, uh, of foreign service. Uh, So this is a a Jesuit school and he enters it already when he was 19 years old as a really kind of devoted Spenglerian. Um, He is by this time capable of quoting pages after, uh, like a page after page from the decline of the West. Mm -hmm. Um, There he became close to like a younger professor called Walter Jaeger who's 34 years old, uh, a professor of international relations. And he, at the time, had similar views to to Yoki. And um, like Yoki, he was interested in the relationship between international law and foreign policy. Um, and what is especially interesting uh, about this guy, Jaeger, is that he was very influenced by another kind of different Nazi, German, that was the Major General Karl, Karl Haushofer. And through this professor, uh, Yoki also becomes very influenced by Haushofer. Now, Haushofer uh, was a professor at the University of Munich. He he was an early Nazi, but also a part of this uh, conservative revolution, like heterogeneous okay. milieu that I mentioned, mm-hmm. but more mm-hmm. uh, more connected to the actual Nazi party. He is known Some kind of public intellectual. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was known, for example, that he, uh, like for being a mentor of Rudolf Hess, for example. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but he was like the one of the founders of like German and specifically like what he wanted to be Nazi geopolitics. He was like considered himself like a geopolitical scientist, and he had um, a journal that he published in the thirties, which was all about you know geopolitics. Um, and he was interesting because he was a proponent of this idea that if Germany wanted to be a real superpower, like a world power, it had, it needed to go into an alliance with Russia. Uh, mm-hmm. So he said that the only other option for Germany is an alliance with Britain, uh, but this is like um, an option in which uh, Germany would always have like a kind of a second-rate position, and the preferable thing is to do, uh, to be in an alliance with Russia. So for these reasons, he was a supporter of a kind of a Nazi anti-imperialism, let's call it like mm-hmm. that. He supported anti-colonial nationalist movements, uh, mostly because they were anti-British, which is mm-hmm. what he was. Sure. Right. I mean, we saw this even uh, if we go back to our second arc when we talked about the Bosniak Nazis, yeah. um, that they, you know, they talked a lot about... Um, Countering British imperialism exactly, by yes. mobilizing the Islamic world, which was to be led by European Muslims. Yeah, they definitely used that re- rhetorics when it suited them, but it is known that Hitler actually preferred this idea of an alliance with Britain, and he supported yeah, their yeah. colonial rule in India and so on. Uh, he was like very much into having a, some kind of a white, like Aryan alliance. That's what he preferred to. But Haushofer was one of the leaders of this opposite direction, and he tried to influence Hitler to go into this direction and met him a few times and they discussed these issues. Um, so like Haushofer, for example, um, supported the Indian anti-colonial movement uh, one of the le- le- nationalist leaders in India, a guy called Subhas Chandra Bose, was in the 30s a correspondent, a correspondent of Haushofer's geopolitical journal, for example, and published text there. And during the Second World War, this guy was the leader of the Indian National Army, which was supported by Germany and Japan, which was a kind of a pro-Nazi group in India yeah. there. Um, but uh, Haushofer's closest allies were in Japan. 
um, Haushofer also, he spoke Japanese, Mandarin, Korean, and Russian. Uh, and it is said that some of the, uh, like, a lot of agreements made between Nazis and the regime in Japan were actually made in Haushofer's living room. Uh, so he was a kind of an uh, advocate of an Eurasian liberation front, as some people like Kugan call it. Um, and despite being a close ally of Japan, he also was an advocate of an alliance with China. And he spent a lot of time pers uh, trying to persuade Nazis to align themselves with Russia and uh, Japanese to align themselves with China and Russia. That was kind of his uh, mission there. And he even mocked uh, the idea of an alliance of a uh, uh, white race against uh, the colored world, as they say it. Uh, and he in instead said it would better serve us if our kind of slogan was uh, oppressed people of the world unite. That <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's uh, cultural Marxism. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, you, we can see, we will see later how Haushofer influenced Yoki. And, uh, you know, Yoki followed Haushofer and after the war he would look towards the east uh, to seek allies in, struggle to lib uh, in the struggle to liberate Germany and Europe from what Yoki saw as an allied occupation. So in that sense, he was very anti-American. We'll talk more about that in the future episodes. So um, while in Georgetown, Yoki was also introduced to the ideas of Carl Schmitt. So um, Carl Schmitt was uh, also uh, like one of these intellectual Nazi types from Germany, uh, very well known, influential, even among some leftists. Like in the, the new left, I think in the seventies, were kind of influenced by him. Huh. Uh, he was a Catholic um, international uh, and constitutional law theorist um, and uh, a very fascist guy. Uh, more in this kind of conservative camp of the so-called conservative revolution. Um, but you know, people in this uh, uh, broad milieu were different uh, in the way they how much they wanted to adapt to, you know, Nazi ideology after the Nazi party came to power. And Schmidt was one of those who really wanted to adapt a lot to it. And mm -hmm. he, he also became a member of the Nazi party. I think Spengler also became a member of the Nazi party. But uh, Schmidt became more enthusiastic about it, even though his ideas were not always really compatible with National Socialism completely, although he tried to make them compatible. Um, so Yoki was also influenced by him very much. He even pla plagiarized all of his writings in Imperium, especially the ones about Machiavelli, for example. Um, so Carl Schmitt really despised, you know, liberal democracy, and he developed this uh, theory of the state of exception uh, for the purpose of overcoming um, constitutional rule through the su suspension of the constitution during, during a crisis. So he ha had this definition of a sovereign, that a sovereign is exactly the one who is capable of making an, an exception to a rule, that, that that's what defines them as a sovereign. Um, and he saw, saw the state as supreme and that it, the very existence of a state is proof of its superiority over okay. the validity of the legal norm. So he's kind of a legal theorist that say that really kind of might is right. Yeah, might, that's, I was about to say the exact yeah. same basically thing. basically yeah, his yeah. legal theory. You know? Yeah, um, we won. Fuck Creative. You. Yeah. So um, he, uh, according to Schmidt, uh, state historically goes through three stages. There was an absolutist state, uh, in, this was in the state of the 17th and 18th century, a uh, so-called neutral liberal state, which was the state of the 19th century. And then the 20th century brings us the totalitarian state, in which state and society are identical. And I guess this is the state that Schmidt likes. So, for example, he uses his yeah, theories... So, yeah. unlike... Um... <laughs> Unlike you know the czarist state of the nineteenth century or the the sultan state of the nineteenth century or well you can argue that th those states had like less control o over their citizens in some ways like they were brutal and you know absolutist definitely but the, they didn't have all the mo the tools of the modern state to mm. control them completely like for example the school system or you know all the other things that the modern state has that really kind of um, completely absorbs society into a state. Right, maybe. sure. Well, I'd prefer to look at it like they did a really good job oppressing people even without those tools. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You could say that, yeah. 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 But he, I think Schmidt is a, a really kind of 
enthusiastic about this idea of you know society and the state being the same. Mm-hmm. And he uses his um, he uses uh, his legal theories to justify a lot of things that Nazis do. For example, the so-called Knight of Long Knives. Oh, when yeah. was that? 1934. I forget now. When the the Nazis who are in power now decided to kill a bunch of Nazis. Uh, who they saw as dissidents, and especially the leaderships of the the brown shirts, the SA. Starting example. a very tra- proud Nazi tradition for many decades yes. to come. And, yeah. mm-hmm. But they didn't kill only them, they killed a lot of people who were also uh, members of the this kind of, I mean, very loose uh, conservative evolutionary milieu, and some of which were very, con- like, more on the conservative side and were friends of Karl Schmidt, but Schmidt justified this, um, you know. He said that this is a necessary act um, that took precedent over conventional norms or something like this. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, that's almost exactly what I was going to say in like a mock German uh, accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty it's predictable. The, yeah, it's still the might makes right theory of law. Like, we did it, so it's legal. It's fine. It's like it's a purge, but a necessary purge. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah. Exactly. So um, he also had like, Although he was very enthusiastic about you know Nazis killing Nazis and stuff like that, sure. he also ha- uh, he had uh, like problems with Nazis, and he had problems because he uh, he had a non Aryan wife, Opa. and his his wife actually was Yugoslav. I think he was she was Serbian. I'm not sure, huh. and I think I think that she act- that Schmidt actually had two uh, Yugoslav wives. Like he was huh. married twice. He's like I their think- William Pierce. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that one per- uh, like preferred. Hungarians, you know? Yeah. This one is into Yugoslavs. Um, <laughs> so, he developed uh, an idea of Großraumordnung, um, <laughs> or uh, literally means uh, great space order. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, he believed that the nation state system is bro- like, was broken and that. Um, this dem- demands the establishment of Grossraum, of this great space order, as an area which is dominated by by a power, like a political power, but one that is primarily seen as a political idea. So, mm-hmm. for example, um, uh, se- like German-dominated Central Europe is, you know, as an, a political idea, very different from its two universalist opponents, you know, the the liberal space on the west of it and the socialist communist space on the east of it. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's an kind of ideology that is also has a spatial dimension. Some, I mean, I'm really disappointed by this. I thought Great Space Order was going to be like the original Galactic Imperium. No, no, no. This sucks. Yeah. So just just <laughs> some territory. Yes. Uh, okay. But he uses this language. You can see why, you know, like, Later, like post-war theorists, especially in France, kind of liked him because he says simple things in very, you know, complicated, pretentious language. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, so under this concept, for example, uh, national-specific groups still exist, but they are, um, you know, preserved but subsumed under Berlin's political, economical, and military hegemony, for example. Uh, so Haushofer, uh, the guy we mentioned before, the geopolitician guy, he had some co- like comparable and compatible ideas to this. Uh, for example, when he argued that you know imperialism needed some kind of an uh, ideological content to really work. And for, he suggested that Europe, which is interesting, that Europe... Uh, the European concept, this a new empire that they wanted to build, that it needed something similar to pan-Slavism, uh, a new uh-huh. supranational idea that would seek to manifest itself in space. Interesting. So, yeah. Hmm. Uh, the Bakuninist origins of Lebensraum. Yeah. No. Don't well, say Bakunin that. wasn't. Uh, he didn't. He didn't. You know, pan-Slavist ideas didn't originate with. Him. Yeah, I'm. No. I'm. I'm fucking around. <laughs> no. So, um, so while in Georgetown, you know, the student Francis Parker Yockey, he wrote an essay, I think, for the university uh, about the historical struggle in the United States between liberal and traditional forces. So we can see now how he applies these things, these shitty things that he's reading from these European fancy Nazis to American history. And it's not very original. It's something that we saw before. So... Um, Yockey uh, says that, you know, with the decline of the Federalists in America, 
uh, America grew into two separate societies. One was the South, which is a patriarchal aristocratic society based on agriculture and muscle energy. <laughs> oh, yes, hey-o. it doesn't specify whose muscle. <laughs> no, it's a muscle energy. See, he um, also invented corporate doublespeak. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and North, which is a plutocratic uh, society based on manufacturing and commerce uh, with the basis in coal energy. So, yeah, the people there eat the coal. They yeah. don't have anything to do with the slavery in the South. I'm sorry, no. the muscle energy. <laughs> My bad. Yes. Uh, good. Um, so good the, Dred, the Dred Scott decision, which we discussed before, uh, mm. that was the last time when the blood spoke. <laughs> um, and since then, the U.S. Uh, constitutional law became the law of money. Um, and after the Civil War, uh, the whole nation became plutocratic. Um, so he also thought that since the First World War, uh, the bourgeoisie in America uh, went into de- a decline and uh, we did all of its political institutions. So that meant that uh, after that, all real politics must be extra parliamentary. So the street, according to Yorkie, will become um, the center of struggle, not the courtrooms. And he saw evidence of this um, in the activities of the American left at the time. So we're talking about Great Depression and, you know, unions being organized and worker strikes and so on. And he There's a little bit of Richard Butler in there too, right? I, I was mean, thinking that, mm-hmm. yeah. And that kind of um, analysis of pre-Civil War and then Civil War, well, post-Civil uh, War American society. You know, if Butler had connections with um, the movement at that time, and we thought that we think that maybe he did, it's very possible that he heard Yoki speak because Yoki speak at a lot of sure. a lot of meetings at that time, as I will mention soon. A voice yes. of the blood also came up in our podcast yeah. in this arc too. I can't think of who used to say that all the time. Yeah, yeah, mm. that is familiar as well. Yeah. So, um, as I said, he saw the, the evidence of, you know, this, that the politi- all the real politics must be extra-parliamentary in the streets. He saw it in the activities of the left. But he also thought that it's necessary to resist uh, to these activities in an extra-legal and extra-parliamentary way. So, you, you, you know, you see the way he speaks. You see, sh- like, Schmidt's influence there as well. Um, and for this reason, he supported, for example, in the 30s, the formation of uh, right-wing militias, like the Michigan Vigilantes, for example. Uh, mm-hmm. The Mi- Michigan Vigilantes fought strikers in Detroit auto factories. Mm. Uh, they, this, this vigilante group also worked closely with Henry Ford's private security, sure. by the way, yeah, and were supported by the American Legion and also a group called the Veterans of Foreign Wars, which is like a super mm-hmm. patriotic American group. Yeah, VFW. Um, they together attacked workers. And what is interesting is, you know, at the time when Yoki wrote this, this uh, super patriotic American group called Veterans of the Foreign Wars, also made an, op- an open alliance with the German-American Bund. And the leader of the group met with Fritz Kuhn, and there is like a photo of them together. And they uh, like met together and some, signed some kind of agreement in, in support of these vigilantes who were fighting against the workers. Yeah, I mean, Kuhn himself would say that he, he his group is merely just like basically the american legion but german yeah and similar to these other kind of patriotic yeah. organizations mm-hmm. so yoki left georgetown in 1938 without graduating uh, they had some family problem they had to move to arizona uh, apparently because one of his sisters suffered from asthma so he actually graduated at the university of arizona in tucson um, and then left arizona and moved back to chicago there, he again enrolled in another school, the North- Northwestern Law School. Uh, and now this is important period for him because this is now where he gets involved really closely into the, the American fascist scene of the time in 1930s Chicago. Uh, while in Chicago, uh, he served as a kind of an aide to a lawyer and a right-wing leader called Newton Jenkins. I don't remember if you mentioned him before. So, Doesn't sound familiar. Newton Jenkins was originally a member of the progressive movement, and he was a big supporter of FDR and the New Deal. Um, in 1932, for example, he ran in a Republican primary for like Senate elections, and he got more than 400,000 votes. Oh. So he was like a, a prominent politician there. 
Um, but uh, he changed his mind about FDR in some way, we'll see that, and he became a promoter of America First Committee, of he was, which he was a member of, and similar groups. Um, mm-hmm. But more than that, he also, Jenkins, Newton Jenkins also maintained extensive ties to German, the German-American Bund mm-hmm. and a lot of other fascist groups at the time. And he was one of the people who was very committed to the idea of uniting all of these various fascist and Nazi groups uh, into a third party. And for that purpose, he founded a third party, which was called the Third Party. And um, <laughs> all right, um, hey, the order, yeah. the organization, the book, the Third Party. Yes. Um, so he ex- Jenkins explained that he became critical of FDR because FDR uh, shied away from the more radical aspects of the New Deal, which is kind of interesting that you have in this time an American fascist who is criticizing, you know, New Deal for not being New Deal enough. Like, yeah. not, like you would do expect that right-wingers would, you know, go into an opposite direction, some kind of a libertarian direction. Mm-hmm. But Newton Jenkins was very, uh, very open about wanting more state intervention in the economy, except his examples of, like, good practice were not, you know, socialist countries. They were Mussolini and Hitler. This is what okay. he Okay, all right. Um, was he was he one of these kind of more monetarist types? Did he talk a lot about coinage and silver and stuff? I don't know. It's very possible, but I don't know. Mm-hmm. I have to say that I don't know. Um, so in 1935, Newton Jenkins uh, participated in a, a, a meeting, which the idea of the meeting was forming this third party, and it was attended by the leaders of the German-American Bund, by William Dudley Pelly of the mm-hmm. Silver Shirts, uh, also by some anti-labor union uh, operative called Harry Jung and many others. Uh, next year, in 1936, Newton Jenkins became um, a campaign manager uh, for uh, the Union Party. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Which was Coughlin's found... Party, right? Yeah, that's a party yeah. which was fa- uh, started by Father Charles Coughlin and also by this other American radio fascist that we mentioned a few times, Gerald L.K. Smith. Yeah, boy. So they uh, nominated some um, congressman, uh, William Lenke, for president, I guess, as a challenge to FDR. So I, I'm talking all uh, all this be, uh, about this Newton Jenkins guy because at the time, Francis Parker Yockey was a close collaborator of his and his aide. And obviously, this guy is connected to everyone. Like, he's an influential person and uh, American fascism. And not only connected to everyone, but his mission is to uniting all of the American fascists. Mm-hmm. So he's mm-hmm. close, you know, to the German-American Bund, to the Silver Shirts, to Coughlin. He's a, a member of the American uh, First Committee. So he's everywhere. And Yoki is with him, you know. Did he work for the FBI? <laughs> uh I don't know about him. Many others did. It's possible that he did yeah. as well. Um, Sounds like their so, man. So while in Chicago, uh, Yoki himself established, you know, connections with all of these groups. So like the German-American Bund and uh, specifically the uh, Father Coughlin's group and also uh, the Silver Shirts. Um, so uh, Yoki spoke at the meetings of all of these groups, like Father Coughlin's group, Silver Shirts, German American Bund, and participated in a lot of meetings where they all were uh, coming together and trying uh, to. That, that means a lot. I mean, that's yeah. that's like the scene. Yes, yes, I mean... yes, very much so. Uh, and he, even back then, you know, when he was a very young guy in the 30s, he was seen as a kind of an intellectual, kind of smart ass leader of the movement, let's mm-hmm. say. Um, uh, you, you can see where, how, you know, yes, he's a sophisticated fascist, but a fascist. And we can see that, for example, it, he didn't like his school at the time. And he said something that uh, the school was nothing but a group of Negroes, Jews and communists. Um, Quite sophisticated. S- yes. So in 1939, he transferred to DePaul Law School. Um, and he was uh, spending a lot of time of his time in this, you know, American fashy world at the time when, you know, it was very vibrant and active and really very much involved into a lot of street fights uh, with the left and anti-fascists. And it's possible that Yoki had something to do with that as well. But we know that he was a prominent and a regular speaker at his fascist meetings, for sure, in the Chicago area specifically. Um, he also, at the time, published his first political text, which was called The Tragedy of Youth, 
uh, and it appeared in 1939, and it appeared in the issue of the newspaper Social Justice, which was published by Father Collins' uh, yeah. move- movement. Yoki was also a member of the America uh, First Committee at the time. Awesome. Um, so um, here we introduce another guy uh, called William B. Uh, Wernicke. I don't know, Wernicke, Wernicke, I don't know how you pronounce it. It's a German name. Um, he's a, a leading Chicago Bundist, like a leader of the uh, German-American Bund. And he was also a former head of the Bund's local security unit. So he was a thug. Mm-hmm. Uh, like a leader of Bundist thugs in Chicago. Um, and he was, uh, so this guy, Wernicke, was very close both to Newton Jenkins and to Yoki at the time. Um, he is also a kind of a networker, uh, but a German guy who also has connections with Germany and a lot of shady characters who have connections with two actual, like actual Nazi Nazis in Germany. Mm-hmm. Um uh, Wernicke also had a farm outside of Chicago, or, which was a place for meetings, like silver shirt, bund meetings, uh, and also used as a, like a training uh, ground and sh- like for shooting practice. And Yoki did spend some time there, like with all of these other people. And I'm for trying example, to picture is Yoki is Yoki kind of like a I picture him as like a kind of a oh, what's his name a uh, fucking uh, punch in the face guy. God well, damn it. Um, Oh my God! Which era are you talking? Our about? era. I can't get Richard Butler's name out of my Richard head. Spencer. Richard Spencer. Yes. Yeah. I picture yeah. him as like one of these kind of clean cut, like yes. uh, college yeah. conservative looking guys. Is that about yes, right? Yes. Was he yes. like was he like a cool dude? I think he. I mean, he he thought of himself that he's the coolest dude. Like that's, okay, that's all how right. he saw himself. Okay, I mean, got he, him now. Yeah. He, right. he was definitely like he was like handsome. He was smart. He you know was educated. Played very well the piano so i guess he 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 could impress a lot of people although uh-huh. he he's also kind of deeply fucked up as we'll see uh-huh. uh but well uh, i mean if you find yourself on a shooting range with like nazi thugs <laughs> yes <laughs> something yeah. went wrong yeah yeah so in 1940 um yoki again leaves school and now he uh, enrolls into the notre dame law school where he graduates cum laude, and in 1941, uh, he passed the Michigan Law uh, Board and returned to Chicago. So now he's a lawyer in 1941. He, oh, I just imagine him as being insufferable, too. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. This careerist fucking smart-ass Nazi. Yeah, freak, yeah, yeah. You know? yes. He was also one of these kind of posh dudes that became yeah. a Nazi. Right? Oh, this awful. Is... Worst but, kind. Uh, he, he, he wasn't careerist in the sense that he was too good for a career. He saw that as too ordinary you know he didn't Mm. want a job he wanted a nazi revolution that and he was kind of dedicated to that Mm -hmm. he he hated family life and everything like middle class is what he was it seems like he wanted the title though you know you could say he's a lawyer he's something like this because i wouldn't think like we need revolution now i'm going to grad school yeah yeah, i know a lot of people say that (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) Uh, although he he got some good jobs but he didn't keep them as we'll see um, so I think he didn't have a career in mind. In, okay. Um, Title. Then, yeah. yeah. So um, how do you, uh, this is uh, coin, is it coin, C-O-Y-N-E, coin, or? Um, hmm. I, I guess so. Okay. Huh? So in Maybe 40... oh, is it, could it be a variant of Cohen? Like, is it some Welsh? No. No, no, no. Weird. Let's say it's coin. So <laughs> okay. in, in, in 41, his oldest sister, Vinette, married this guy, William Coyne. He, I mean, he is relatively important to the story because he worked for naval intelligence. Okay. Um, and we'll mention him later as well. So that's, Coyne is, you know, his oldest sister's husband, naval intelligence guy. And uh, so this is like uh, through... This connection with his sisters and this guy is how the FBI um, notices uh, uh, Francis Parker Yoki in 1941 in like a very bizarre way. So um, uh, his sister Winnet and her husband William went to the FBI in 1941 in Chicago and complained about that guy William Wernicke that I mentioned who was the Bundes leader in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like a tag, uh, who was also independently wealthy, by the way. A lot, of, I don't know why mm-hmm. these assholes. A lot of them are independently wealthy. Um, and Yoki also sent a letter to FBI uh, concerning the same issue. So apparently, the Yokis uh, had some problem with this 
former close friend of theirs and collaborator William Wernicke. Uh, it's not completely clear what was going on, but th- what they said to the FBI was that um, he, their sister, uh, Alice Yorkie, was a friend of a young woman who Wernicke was obsessed with and was prose- persecuting her. And this is why he came into conflict with the Yorkies. So they said to the FBI that Wernicke was calling uh, Alice Yorkie's employer and talk shit about her, said how she worked for Germany, um, and that uh, uh, this naval intelligence guy is actually a Japanese spy, and he's giving stuff to the the Japs, Um, and that also that the Yokis were drug addicts, drug dealers, and kidnappers. Uh, Because she wouldn't fucking date him? Yeah, but this is interesting because all of this we know because Yorkies are saying to the FBI that Ver- Wernicke was making these accusations against them. You know? Yeah. We don't know him from him. So, um, and they really wanted the FBI to arrest this guy, Wernicke. So, uh, this is very interesting because of the other things that were going on at the time. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, I'm going to have to get up in a second, just real quick to go to the kitchen, but I'm good. Okay. Okay. But I think you might want to stay for this. It's interesting. <laughs> so, uh, all this madness with the FBI and these Nazis ratting on each other was happening in a very interesting period. And this is because uh, at right about the same time, your, your, uh, the FBI noticed the Yorkies for another reason. And this is uh, because uh, Yorkie's sister, Alice Yoki was also attending a lot of these Nazi meetings. And she, apparently an informer said that she went to some of these meetings accompanied by a guy called Herbert Hans Haupt. Herbert Hans Haupt? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> apparently, so I, I won't tell you uh, right away who he is because uh, it's... Uh, you said no pedophiles, right? It, 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 he is No, this story All so right. far at least doesn't have any pedophiles. Okay. All right. So, um, not that we know of. Um, <laughs> so um, Herbert Hans Haupt was friend, friendly apparently not only with Yoki's sister but with Yoki himself and why is uh, Herbert Hans Haupt uh, interesting because he is a, has a central lore, uh, role in a little thing which is called Operation Pastorius mm. so Operation Pastorius is a Nazi intelligence operation, uh, which was named after like a, some German guy, uh, like uh, I think Franz Daniel Pastorius, who was the leader of the first German settlement in America. Okay. So, so for this reason, they named him after him. Um, so uh, what happened here? So this guy Haupt. Uh, Haupt was um, born in 1919 in Germany. Uh, and he w- migrated to the U.S. when he was five years old with his family. Uh, and he's one of these German-American guys who was very active in Chicago in the Bund. Bund. Okay. Uh, also a very close friend and collaborator of William Wernicke, um, the guy who now Yorkies have this uncomfortable thing with uh, the FBI. Uh, and Haupt also spent a lot of time in Wernicke's farm, shooting there with him, Remember, this is the same farm where, you know, Yoki frequented and had meetings with the silver sheds there and so on. Right. Um, he was also involved with, a, like, had a relationship with a woman called Gerda Struckmann Melin. Um, and so it is speculated by Coogan that this is the girl that they mention uh, in this correspondence with the FBI as being the friend of Alice Yoki, who Wernicke mm. had some obsession with, mm. that this is actually okay. the person who was in a relationship with this guy, Haupt. Uh-huh. So this relationship between Haupt and this woman came to an abrupt end uh, in um, 1941, when Haupt disappeared. And she kind of remem- uh, uh, remembered that he said something uh, that he about having to go to Mexico. <laughs> uh, so Coogan... Um, speculates that uh, both this woman Melind uh, and Alice uh, had a problem with Wernicke because Wernicke ordered Haupt to leave for Mexico. Uh, this is what Coogan thinks. What, what year was this? 41. Uh, uh-huh. Because this is also when uh, a number of 
uh, like top Bundists also went to Mexico, right? The successor to Fritz Kuhn, Gerhard Kunz, mm. I think, who was a German agent, like a straight up spy, also fled to Mexico in 41. Yeah, this is probably connected to that. Um, so um, the idea that Coug- Kevin Coogan has is that, you know, he escaped to Mexico and then from Mexico helped, went to Germany and then he came back to the U.S. from Germany. Uh-huh. But the way he came back was interesting and this is what is called Operation Pastorius. Uh-huh. So in May of 1942, Yoki's um, legal career came to an abrupt halt uh, because Yoki enlisted in the U.S. Army. So this guy who's like a very active in the Nazi scene, very committed to Germany, enlists in the U.S. Army in, 19, in May of 1942. Now we are in 1942. Okay, okay. Um, Interesting, yeah. He and, wasn't alone. Yeah, and so he, the, the, the Army intelligence knows about him. They know that he's a Nazi. They classify him as a subversive person. Uh, as a like admirer of William Dudley Pelly and um and command material yeah, yeah. well <laughs> probably but uh in September of 1942 uh, Yoki go like he goes AWOL no one knows mm. where he is he disappears for two months and reappears in November of 1942 uh he turned himself to army central somewhere um, so he went missing for two months and no one we- knows where he went. Um, but, uh, Coogan thinks that this has something to do with this Operation Pastorius and with this guy Haupt that they okay. know, knew. Hmm. Uh, so the Operation Pastorius began in early 42. Um, it was an Abwehr led, uh, Abwehr is, uh, military intelligence in Germany, in Nazi Germany, hmm. um, uh, operation and, um, of sabotage uh, uh, in the United States. And it was something that Hitler demanded himself that they do. Uh, so it was envisioned as an, a, se- a series of assaults on um, major war-related aluminum plants in New York, uh, Tennessee, and Illinois, um, as well as on uh, a railroad line uh, that supplied coal to war factories on the East Coast. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Um, uh, in charge of this operation was a guy called Walter Kappe, who was also one of these German-American Bundist guys um, who went, you know, back uh, from Germany to the U.S. and back uh, to Germany and then back to the US, U.S. and so on. In the 1920s, he was living in the United States and he was, uh, for example, this Kappe guy, Walter Kappe, was uh, close to a guy called uh, Fritz Gisibel, who was the founder nice. of the Teutonia Society ah. in in, uh, ah, right. in the U.S. And Newton Jenkins, the mentor of Francis Parker Yockey, was close uh, to both uh, Walter Kappe and this guy who was the leader of the Teutonia Society. So all of these people knew each other very well. Um, especially uh, Newton Jenkins had a relationship with Kappe during his Union Party campaign. Um a lot of these people, Kappe included, but uh, some of these other people that I mentioned, they also started another group in the 30s, which was called uh, Kameradschaft USA. Kameradschaft. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, Kameraderie, I guess. Yeah, um, that's what they, they called them in the ANP, too. They started this in Stuttgart, uh, but the main task of the Kameradschaft USA was to, the main official task was to help German nationals return to the fatherland, you know. Mm-hmm. But in reality, they also served as a kind of a shadow of intelligence agency in the United States. Um, so in 1942, Kappe was an SS officer, and he was now in charge of training these saboteurs who would be sent to the U.S. And mm. one of these people, the youngest of the eight who was chosen, was this Herbert Hans Haupt guy, hey. who went from Mexico to Germany and joined this training camp. At the time, he was also a member of the SS and was awarded an Iron Cross. And this is, sorry, Yoki's sister's, like, boyfriend. Yes, friend. He, they attended, like, fascist meetings in Chicago together. Okay. And he, he also knew Yoki as well. Now, okay. he escaped to Mexico, disappeared. No one knows where he is. He went to Germany. Got a, when he arrived there, got an Iron Cross. We don't know for what. He certainly did something in the U.S. to deserve an Iron Cross. Mm. and was now trained in this SS training camp uh, and chosen among eight people who, as a part of um, 
Operation Pastorius will be sent on U-boats back to the United States. Crazy. Yeah. Um, so, th- th- okay, this is not a, there was not a very successful, as you imagine, um, uh, mission. It kind of reminds us of uh, our episode about the stay behind uh, units in Yugoslavia. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so they they also were um, split in two groups. Um, the uh, one uh, was led by a guy called Georg Dash. It um, landed on a beach no on, they landed on long island on june uh, 12th 1942 and the group led by haupt um uh they uh, landed in the, on u.s soil five days later of 17th of june 1942 it somewhere 25 miles southeast of jacksonville uh, florida ah hmm. um long island but, and jacksonville were they immediately like just murdered randomly on the spot Almost uh, the uh. the the first group <laughs> the first group on Long Island they were immediately spotted by um, a Coast Guard patrolman uh-huh. and he like questioned them and then let them go and then went went back for backup and then returned to find them again which is like okay uh, <laughs> they did nothing about it. guys we got away with it <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, some relax. German guys like popped up on the shore in 1942 <laughs> yeah. yeah out of a U boat. <laughs> Or is that your submarine over there? <laughs> uh, we are just uh, here to visit our, our friend Schmidt. Yes, we're having a picnic here. A bit. Yeah. So, uh, so these patrolmen returned with backup and couldn't find them, but they actually find, found a bu- buried uniforms and equipment. I don't know why these people had uniforms exactly. Yeah, so right. They, they the need them, you know. It's not very undercover yeah. there. Yeah. You gotta have the. The whole point is the uniforms. <laughs> No, the okay. whole point is the uniforms. We're bringing them. <laughs> so, so they, uh, this first group, uh, like, managed actually not to get arrested immediately. But their leader Dash, like, uh, uh, got uh, like in, into some panic mode, and a day later he called FBI and turned himself in. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how the the Pastorius, uh, 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 you, you know. Uh, got found out about the, they called the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I guess it beats the cyanide capsule or whatever yes. they're supposed to do. <laughs> so they got all arrested. But uh, what we know that Haupt uh, was supposed to find regular employment when you know back in uh, the US. Sure. Um, and he actually was supposed to get his old job in the Simpson Optical uh, Company in Chicago. Uh, he was also supposed to set up a series of uh, safe houses for the next wave of Pastorius agents. Um, and uh, his mission was to uh, reconnect with William Wernicke, um, who would connect him with a Chicago doctor who would give to how, uh, how he would provide help with some pills that would speed up his heart rate so he was able to flunk the army physical. So this was mm. essential there. Complex. Um, but Hout was arrested because his buddy called the FBI. Um, he refused to cooperate with the FBI, but a month later, they were all electrocuted. (laughs) 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 Yes, and um, uh, a month after that, Yoki went AWOL. I see. I see. Those guys get electrocuted, and then uh, a month later, Yoki, who is now in the army, uh, goes AWOL. Um, and we know later that he would, after the war, he would boast to some Italian fascists that he met how he did some things for the Third Reich during the war. Okay. So, mm-hmm. uh, and these two months that we don't know where he was uh, probably have something to do with it. Mm-hmm. So while he was AWOL, uh, Newton Jenkins died of heart attack. Um, and also... Uh, the U.S. Uh, government arrested and started a trial for treason against Herbert Haupt's parents, who are also Bundists, and his uncle and aunt, and also the parents of his two uh, of uh, the parents of his friend. So all of these people Word. got arrested and were tried for treason while Yoki was, you know, missing. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, uh, J. Edgar Hoover uh, personally announced how William Wernicke was also indicted for draft evasion and how they found a bunch of guns and uh, ammunition on his farm. All of this is happening with, with, while we don't know where Yoki is. Right. So, 22nd of November 1942, Yoki voluntarily returned to the U.S. Army camp, in, uh, G- camp Gordon in Georgia. 
so at the time, the Ar Army Intelligence had like a file on him that said that he was a Nazi sympathizer. Um, and, you know, they had the, like sources who claimed, all, uh, like informed them of everything that we knew that he, you know, spent the time uh, on the Wernicke farm uh, and that, you know, giving speeches and so on. Um, but uh, after he, so they know, they know who he is and he was missing for two months and that his friends were in the meantime, you know, electrocuted and so on. Mm. Um, so, uh, but when he returned to the US, U.S. Army, uh, Yoki suffered a nervous breakdown um, and he was placed in a U.S. Army hospital. So the, the psychiatrist who, you know, saw him at the time wrote down that he suffered from the illusions of persecution, mm. uh, which involved many people in his environment. And that he had ideas of grandeur, that he uh, was constantly saying how he was better than anyone else, really. Uh -huh. um, and um, he also involved uh, like prominent people in his delusional system. He admitted to psychiatrists that he had some auditory hallucinations and that he heard the voice of his father talking okay. to him from time to time. Um, and uh, so the psychiatrist recommended that he should be discharged uh, due to dementia precox paranoid type. Do you um, do you think that that is the case, or do you think he did this in order to get out of army service? Later, he was very proud how he fooled the army, mm -hmm. and he, uh -huh. that's what he was saying to his fresh friends later. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Maybe maybe a mix of both. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Uh, in January 1943, he was transferred to like a private sanatorium in Georgia, uh, where he spent 10 days uh, before uh, being released. There he was re-diagnosed re as a par like suffering from some kind of a psychosis and being in a paranoid state. Mm. And he got an honorable discharge from the army in, on July 13, 1943. Um the same year, he married Alice McFarlane in San Antonio, Texas, and they moved to Detroit, and Yoki started working for some law firms there. It's a little uh, weird to me that he married somebody with the same name as his sister. I don't know why. Yes. It's petty, yes, but that's, that's a little Two weird. Alice Yokis in this story. Yeah. yeah. So um, they got two daughters, which were called Isolde Alice. and, Brun and oh. Brunhilde. <laughs> so Brunhilde Isolde and, Brunhilde. and I Isolde, which they called Lolly and Bruni. Hmm. Yeah. Brunhilde later changed Cute her names. name, by, by the way. Sure. Yeah. Um, Brenda. She's Brenda now. No, something like Francesca or something like this. Oh, all right. Yeah. Good for her. Go for yeah. it. So, uh, Yoki became an uh, assistant prosecutor for Wayne County there. So, mm. he got a good job. Mm -hmm. um, and he held it until December of 44. So, he quit, you see. He, he, had his, he was assistant prosecutor and he quit in 44. Mm. Um, and then started working in a Detroit branch uh, office of price, uh, price administration. While working there, he was saying Nazi stuff all the time, so much so that his co-workers complained to the FBI. We've Common seen this theme. before. Yeah. yeah. They can't yeah. shut up about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the war is still going on. He's talking yes. about that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, so also during this time, uh, his uh, marriage with Alice fell apart. And some people who knew them say that his wife, Alice, thought that he was a lunatic and that he, she was terrified of him. Fair enough. Um, also kind of common theme, too. Also, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So we, this is basically the end of the episode. Uh, he makes, at this time, a really interesting, weird, and crucial decision. And he decides to become um, a lawyer at the Nuremberg process against Nazi yeah. war criminals. Yeah. Uh, and he gets the job. Amazing. So he, he had a few things going, like working for him, like in order to get this job. So he graduated cum laude at the Notre Dame Law School, which is like prestigious school. He also went to the also prestigious Georgetown School of Foreign Service. Mm -hmm. uh, he spoke German. Um, honorably discharged from the army from the army and so on yeah. but he was also like a fucking nazi and everyone yeah. knows, knows this yes um, right. <laughs> so oh in october of 45 he went to uh, dc and applied for a passport to um uh, to go to germany on official business um he almost didn't go uh, because just before he was supposed to go he got arrested for shoplifting um black negligee wow okay uh, Nice. Which is something that later happened almost exactly with uh, Colin Jordan. I think I don't know if you re uh, we mentioned that in an episode, but he 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 I also so. was arrested for shoplifting some red 
uh, lingerie, I think. Um, <laughs> All right. Okay, but uh, he... We, we called David Myatt the panty thief. I feel bad now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but he managed to go to Nuremberg. Uh, and that's it for now, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, what happened next in the next episode. Great. That's really interesting, that's a... though, because like, um, there's this... Uh, I don't know. One of the sort of stories you hear floating around about Yaki is that Yaki, while because he was at Nuremberg became a sympathizer to the Nazis that he saw no, how no. unjust it would be and blah, blah, blah. But of course he's been a Nazi for fucking ever. Yeah. No, no. He went specifically there to meet his idols. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Comic-Con for him. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, it's kind of amazing out of all the, the lawyers that they could select for such a thing. They just did go with the guy that has a documented history of being a Nazi sympathizer. And psychotic. Kind of curious. <laughs> Yeah, and psychotic, yeah. <laughs> Kicked out of the army for being a psych. Yeah. Yeah. Look, look, let's psychosis. look at his file. Okay. A psychotic Nazi. Well, okay. Why not? Perfect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do you think, James Jesus Angleton? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Mm. Well, great start. Yeah. This is just. Wait, start. he stole that lingerie to bribe J. Edgar Hoover to That's put what it in good yeah, work exactly, for him with, right. uh, with the guys to send him to Nuremberg yeah. so he can meet all of his buddies. <laughs> Thanks, man. Put it together. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to to continuing the story. I don't, uh, I don't know. As far as like initial reflections go, um, dude's a Nazi. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> a He's pretentious one of the, Nazi. Yeah. One of the, the smarties. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's good to see the little highlight reel, too, of, yeah, of yeah. the 1930s. Pretty much everybody that we talked about, um, you know, from Pelly to yeah, yeah, yeah. numerous Bundists, America First, Coglin, mm -hmm. all uh, make an appearance here. Yeah, yeah. And, and apparently frequenting a lot of meetings together. Like, they were really a scene, you know. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Those well, were the days. <laughs> For American fascists, it was, I guess. The last real attempt at a mass movement. Mm-hmm. The 30s? Yep. Yeah. Well, they fucking lost, kind of. Kind <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of. All right, Only well, kind of. Let's, uh, let's get out of here. Uh, yeah, let's pick back up on this next week, huh? And um, well, the plan um, is uh, we're going to do uh, what on Friday. Maybe not next now. week. We'll see, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. Okay. New Year's is just around the corner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Ah. Ooh gets crazy it's a liminal period so no promises no promises yeah indeed all right but soon 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 we'll continue this story yeah yeah okay well see you there okay Bye. cheers bye, bye. Fritz here from The Empire Never Ended. This has been one of our weekly free episodes for free people. But for premium people, we also have weekly premium episodes, which you can get at patreon.com slash tenepod, T-E-N-E-P-O-D. And also follow our various social media things in the, in the show description there. Like and subscribe them. Follow them. Like and sub follow and subscribe. Follow them. Do it.